for women. Hello and welcome to the Feisty News for Women. I am T. Erica. I present important women's issues and fearless feminine voices disrupting our society. Today is March 21st, 2022. Here is the Feisty News for Women in World Affairs. It is day 25 of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Although Russia may have thought Ukraine would be an easy takeover, they obviously underestimated the Ukrainian willpower. Russia grows increasingly isolated since invading Ukraine on February 24th and being sanctioned more than 5,000 times by countries across the globe. The Kremlin, which is a name used to refer to the government of the Russian Federation, is implementing a crackdown on media to brainwash the citizens so that they can support the war. Russia has imposed laws against spreading fake news or discrediting the Russian armed forces, prompting many journalists and activists to leave Russia. Marina, an editor at State Control Channel One, was detained after she ran onto the set during a live broadcast of one of Russia's most watched news programs, Vremia, holding a sign saying, no war, stop the war, don't believe the propaganda, they are lying to you here. Marina was detained and questioned for 14 hours and then fined 30,000 rubles for the stunt. And she still said, I'm ashamed that I allowed myself to tell lies from the television screen. To spread the propaganda, thousands of posts appeared on Russia so Russian social media featuring school children attending special patriotic lessons. A Russian hospital for children with cancer shared a photo of the children standing in the snow forming a Z, the Russian symbol for victory. The Z symbol can be seen all around Russia as a sign of support for the Russian president. The country's internet regulator ordered media outlets to delete reports using the words invasion or war and only rely on official government sources, which call the Ukraine war a special operation. Russian citizens are told that Ukraine never truly existed as a country and was once just a tiny piece of land called Malarai Saya. This is his created truth, and he wants his country to believe with him. He has enough power to ensure that Russian citizens are not exposed to any other viewpoints, which means that they cannot choose for themselves what to believe and will have blind faith in him and his truth. Are you doing the same? What is truth? Truth is subjective based on the perspective of the person sharing it. Every media outlet, including all social media, has an agenda, a perspective that they want to convey so that you can understand and accept their viewpoint, even the feisty. I choose the news I want you to see in order to convey my feminist viewpoint, and so does every other news outlet. Just because a person with a microphone or a title says it, doesn't mean it is the absolute truth. When determining which news outlet you should trust, Consider the person who controls it, what their agenda is, and choose wisely. In other news, according to a new bill that was approved by the Idaho House of Representatives, abortions are banned after six weeks of pregnancy and family members who disagree with the woman's decision to have an abortion can sue a doctor who performs the procedure. There's more. They have up to four years to file the lawsuit after she has a procedure. This means that any person related to a man who impregnates a woman, even the family of a rapist or the family of a sexual abuser, can benefit financially from a woman having an abortion if she can find a provider to perform the procedure. They are punishing healthcare providers for offering healthcare service to women. After learning this, you know what I feel like? A commodity. How do others get to benefit from decisions I make for my body? Why are healthcare professionals being threatened with lawsuits if they offer me the healthcare that I seek? Am I not a human? How are decisions made for me as though I am incompetent? My body isn't under conservatorship. Are we living in a twilight zone? What's going on with these pro-lifers? Why do they think a woman should be punished for making a choice for her body in the manner that she sees fit? I had to find out the truth, so I invited a pro-life feminist to the show. Joyce has worked for more than two decades as an advocate for vulnerable populations, including sex trafficking and domestic violence victims. She is a representative of Feminists for Life, a pro-life feminist group. Welcome to the feisty, Joyce. I've never had a conversation with a person who is pro-life, and maybe neither have my audience. 
please help us to understand how a woman can be a feminist and pro-life at the same time. What's the pro-life feminist movement all about? Hi, Tierica. Thanks so much for having me on your show, The Feisty News for Women. I'm super excited to be here. So thank you for the invite. Today, um, so in 1972, two women got together, Pat Goltz and the late Carrie Callahan, and they decided to form a pro-life, pro-woman organization called Feminists for Life. At that time in 1972, a year before Roe was decided, they were they did not know that they thought they were the first pro-life feminists. But with our research, as we would come to find out, the early American suffragists were actually pro-woman, pro-life feminists. So we follow kind of in that early American renaissance of feminism movement. Today, um, Feminists for Life of America believes we believe that women deserve better than abortion. We believe that abortion is a reflection that we have not met the needs of women. We primarily focus on education, resources, support, and advocacy for the most vulnerable among us. So studies have been done as, as to what drives women to choose abortion. And most often those issues include poverty, racism, lack of opportunity, coercion, violence against women, and those are all the issues that we care about. We want women to have real choices. We believe that women, we want to refuse to choose, refuse to choose between our children and women. We don't wanna take sides. We believe in helping both the woman and her unborn child. So we developed a help site called womendeservebetter.com, and that, is our resources website. We offer as many resources, articles on helping, anything that could be helpful when a woman is placing an unplanned pregnancy. We also spend a lot of time talking about violence against women. As feminists, we know that this is a huge issue. And I myself am a survivor of sexual assault. When I was sexually assaulted, I, shortly after I found out that I was pregnant and I did not know if the baby was from my relationship or from the workplace rape. And so going through that was really difficult. So I can definitely speak from personal experience and I was able to choose life, but I didn't know that I could be a feminist and <laughs> pro-life. And it wasn't until much later in my life when I found Feminist for Life that I found I felt like I was at home. I felt like I could focus on the women's issues that were important to me, such as the feminization of poverty and violence against women and making sure that women have resources and support. But I could also focus on the side that I believed in, which was being pro-life and embracing children. We wanted to refuse to choose between our dreams as mothers and our desires as women. Wait, Joyce, what do you mean resources, advocacy to end violence against women? If you're a pro-lifer, aren't you supposed to spit on me, condemn me to hell, and tell me that I'm wrong for being an advocate for the right to access abortion? That is not the foundation of what we're teaching, but I do agree that that is a common um, belief in um, our culture that, you know, in general, there's a stereotype that pro-life people are judgmental, demanding um, and unwilling to consider the different difficult times the woman may be going through. So we're trying to break down those stereotypes. We're trying to say, we believe in offering tangible resources and support. We're not here to judge women. We're here to help women with those resources and support. We also, um, you know, we are pro-choice in the sense that we are pro nonviolent choices. We know that not every pregnancy may result in a woman becoming a single parent, she may place for adoption, she may place for kinship care, you know, um, there could be partnered parenthood. There's a lot of options, there's a lot of creative options. And I think that a lot of times in our cultural discourse, we kind of just stick to, you know, abortion or parenting, and there's like no nuances in that conversation. So I think that we want to talk about that. And I think that that's what we're trying to do. A lot of women, you know, we believe perception is reality. 
So what that means is if you perceive that you have no options because you didn't realize how much resources and support were out there for your choice, then you're going to make what I call a limited choice. You're kind of making like the last resort. Um, but if you were educated and told that you had all these other resources and support, would you have made a different decision? You might. So when women are deciding, you know, you're, you're facing a, a unplanned pregnancy and you're thinking about your life, certainly, like what's going to happen? How's it going to change? There's a life inside of you as well. And I think that we want to value children in our society. And there's this interesting um, problem that our culture has, which is pregnancy is considered a problem right? Or almost like a disease, like, oh my gosh, you got to cure yourself of pregnancy or children are a burden. Children are going to ruin your life. You're going to remain in poverty. You're going to not be able to reach your dreams. And um, I'm somebody who can speak directly to that experience. I've been in a crisis pregnancy. I know the fear. I understand the fear, but I am also here to tell you that my child um, was more than a burden. My child was more than a problem. He was an individual that has brought so much joy to myself, to my family, to his friends. Today, he's 22. <laughs> so I think that we get caught up in the moment of that fear. And if we can kind of step out of that and, and believe that no one emotion lasts forever, so fear doesn't last forever. And if we can focus on the humanity of that child and maybe focus on what will this child bring to this world, whether it be through me, if I become the parent or if I place for adoption or place in someone else's care, that child could bring a lot of gifts. You know, children are gifts. They are not, not burdens and pregnancy is not a disease. It is something to, that we can celebrate even in unplanned times. Well, thank you, Joyce, for um, explaining your stance so eloquently. It seems that pro-life feminists are a different breed from those pro-lifers we see aggressively protesting outside of abortion clinics. What Joyce so eloquently explained is that pro-life feminists add to the woman's choices for her life. They're not necessarily out to take away the woman's choices, which isn't a bad thing. If you want to learn more about your choices as a woman, visit feministsforlife.org. In other news, 22-year-old University of Pennsylvania swimmer Leah Thomas won a National Collegiate Athletic Association swimming championship, beating out the second place winner Emma Wyant of the University of Virginia by less than a second. Leah didn't have time to celebrate because controversy erupted as soon as she was awarded her trophy. The crowd refused to celebrate Leah's achievement because Leah had just become the first known transgender athlete to win a Division I national championship in any sport, and the crowd was not happy about that. This month, the governor of Iowa, Kim Reynolds, signed a bill that prohibits transgender females from participating in girls' high school sports. Over the past two years, more than nine states have enacted laws to bar transgender girls and women from competing in girls' and women's sports. Why? The laws use verbiage like, to ensure that we have fairness and a level playing field for female athletes. You know what? I get it. Under a patriarchal society, the only thing that matters is winning. It's funny how men go to lengthy legal pursuits, creating laws so women can win in sports, but don't go to the same lengths to help women in business or even when it comes to governing our own bodies. The truth is, when it comes to transgender women in sports, I ask you to embrace empathy and consider the transgender experience before you become angry at Leah's win. Leah is a self-professed transgender woman. This means that she presents in this world as a man, yet she feels like a woman on the inside. For most of her life, she likely battled inside of herself over her physical identity and who she felt she really was. Eventually, she decided to express herself as the woman she feels she is in a world where being a man would give her an advantage, socially and professionally. She chose to live a life of double disadvantage, being a woman and being transgender because she wants to live out her truth and every day she's being punished for it. When does Leah get to win in life? Rarely ever. Every day she will be stared at, mocked, and treated like she's a fraud. After a lifetime of abuse from those around her and feeling like ashamed because her life may have been a mistake, this is the one time she gets to stand and be proud of herself. Why take that away from her? So what if another woman comes in second place? Someone has to have second place or first place wouldn't exist. Patriarchy teaches us that we must win at all costs. 
patriarchy has us battling each other, knocking each other in the knees with crowbars, starving ourselves to be thinner and punishing our children for not being fit to be the cogs in the wheel of corporations that don't even benefit our society. Give Leah and yourself a break from patriarchal rule by giving her this chance to celebrate herself. You will have many chances to feel like a winner in life. For Leah, this may be one of few. Be a feminist leader. Instead of pushing her down, use your influence to lift her up and ensure that she has her chance to shine. Time for a break. What happened when a 26 year old drug dealer passed pills to teenagers? Should men be allowed to have guns when they have a history of domestic violence? It's all coming up next. Don't miss it. Hi, I'm Duffy, the founder of Disguise and Surprise. As a mom of two teenage boys, I got really frustrated when I was starting to wrap their presents because as they got older, the gifts they wanted started coming in very recognizable shaped boxes. Think cell phones, wireless earbuds, video games. If you hand it to them wrapped in that shaped box, they know what it is immediately before they open it. Boring, not okay. So I worked with some local labs and designed a set of dividers that are reusable and made in the USA. You take your dividers and you arrange them inside of a shirt box, either around your one special item to disguise or you make sections and you create your own multi-item gift boxes for any occasion throughout the year. Um, the beauty of it is, is the, what I call the universal shirt box mentality. Doesn't matter how old you are, if you get handed a shirt box, you think you're getting close. So when they lift that lid and see something that they really wanted or something way cooler, that's where the excitement comes in. So my mission is to get people to rethink how they give a gift. <laughs> Welcome back. I am T. Erica with the feisty news for women. Girl, guess what? Did you hear about Alexis Wilkins? Girl, she was arrested Tuesday and charged with distributing fentanyl resulting in death. Prosecutors say she sold fentanyl to two teenage girls at the Citadel Mall in Colorado Springs. The girls took the drug to Mitchell High School the following day and then shared it with the third teenager. The third teen snorted a crushed fentanyl pill in a school bathroom, and the teacher found her unresponsive and foaming at the mouth after class. The teenager died. 26-year-old Alexis faces life imprisonment for supplying the drug if she is convicted. Fentanyl? That sounds fancy. What happened to crack? People don't do crack anymore? I thought that was the worst you could get. Well, to get to the bottom of this new age drug, I invited Dr. Kelly Arbor Johnson, the medical director at the National Capital Poison Center in Washington, D.C., back to the show. Dr. Kelly, welcome back. Fentanyl is an illegal street drug. Can you help explain its purpose as a medicine? Sure. And hey, Tierica, thanks for having me on again. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about fentanyl. So fentanyl is an opioid medication. It was actually created years ago as a pain medication for cancer patients who have severe pain. So it's actually a prescription medication in the US and we use it for pain, pain relief in the hospital setting. Okay, Dr. Kelly, it was intended to be used as a painkiller in hospitals but how did it get to the streets and what does it do to the person who uses it? Sure. So as an opioid, fentanyl acts to relieve pain and it can also work on the brain to cause euphoria or a high. And it can also cause respiratory depression, which means that it can make an individual stop breathing. So whether it's used at low doses or high doses, those are the side effects. But in higher doses, um, it can be really, really potent. It's about like, you know, 100 times more powerful than morphine, 50 times more powerful than heroin. And so when people use it outside of a hospital setting, they frequently can get very, very sick, stop breathing and die. And because fentanyl is so powerful, so much more powerful than heroin and morphine, a very, very, very small amount of fentanyl can be deadly. 
Fentanyl is becoming one of the more common drugs that people are affected by um, when they present for medical care now. So it used to be that we really only saw fentanyl in the hospital setting. But recently, over the past several years, um, you know, people in other countries have figured out ways to make it in a lab. And so we're basically importing illicit fentanyl into the US, people are selling it on the streets, and it can be packaged to look just like a normal drug, like normal Percocet or nor normal oxycodone or whatever. So people think that they're getting something else, whether it's heroin, oxycodone, Percocet, but they're actually getting fentanyl. It's very, very cheap to make fentanyl overseas. And for that reason, fentanyl is a contaminant of a large percentage of the drug supply these days. And so that's why we're seeing it over and over again in people who come into the ER with overdoses. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for educating women on the feisty once again. If anyone has any questions about poisons, drugs, or toxicology, please do visit poison.org, where experts like Dr. Kelly are on hand to answer all of your poison-related questions. In other news, senators announced Wednesday that they reached a deal to renew the Violence Against Women Act, which expired in 2018. The current law bans a spouse convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence from purchasing or possessing a firearm. The push for it came after a controversial provision was dropped from the legislation that dealt with whether unmarried partners could keep guns if they were found guilty of violence against a dating partner. Democratic lawmakers have long sought to expand the law to extend that coverage to dating partners, convicted stalkers, and any individual under a protective order. The National Rifle Association was opposed to closing the so-called boyfriend loophole, and it stalled the act's renewal. By removing the loophole, the act is now set to be presented to the president. What does this mean for women? Men who commit violence against their wives can be arrested as soon as they touch a gun. This is so necessary. You know, I look forward to the day when women can view men as protectors instead of people we need protection from. I believe that day is coming and soon. Get ready. Thank you for watching the Feisty News for Women. I am T. Erica. Remember, be feisty. Women must be seen and heard. Welcome to the Feisty. Welcome to the Feisty. Welcome.